Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. The most massive merger of two black holes ever detected and the mysteries it's left us with. The 14-year-old viral hit Shoes is back with a pro-mask follow-up. The new dollar coins in Australia designed specifically for charitable giving and the 96th annual Burning of Zozobra is happening in Santa Fe this Friday. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. It's the most ambitious crossover event in history. Two black holes merged in a massive collision 7 billion years ago, an event that was only just detected by astronomers. Quoting The Verge, The distant show included two major players, one black hole roughly 66 times the mass of our sun, and another black hole roughly 85 times the mass of our sun. The two came close together, rapidly spinning around one another several times per second before eventually crashing together in a violent burst of energy that sent shock waves throughout the universe. The result of their merger? One single black hole, roughly 142 times the mass of our sun. End quote. This makes this new black hole an intermediate sized black hole, just the size that has always eluded astronomers. Smaller black holes, called stellar mass black holes, like the two that collided, are anything between 5 and 100 times the mass of our sun, and are relatively common as are supermassive black holes, ones that are millions and billions the time the mass of our sun. But anything in between? They've previously only existed in theory. Quoting again, The discovery could help explain why the universe looks the way it does, with relatively bountiful scatterings of smaller black holes and a few supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. One theory of how supermassive black holes get so big is that smaller black holes merge over and over, consolidating until they become enormous. But if that were the case, there'd have to be intermediate black holes out there in the universe somewhere. End quote. This merger is also the farthest one the observatories that detected it, US-based LIGO and Italy-based Virgo, have ever detected. 5.3 billion parsecs from us. When massive objects like black holes merge, they create gravitational waves that are huge, literal ripples in space and time. But by the time they make it to us, they're barely detectable. That's where observatories like LIGO and Virgo come in, which have been designed specifically to pick up on these faint gravitational waves. This particular one, dubbed GW190521, was detected on May 21st of last year, and was just published today in the journal's Physical Review Letters and the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Quoting The Verge again, LIGO and Virgo only picked up four little waves from the merger in their detectors, perturbations that lasted just one-tenth of a second. Scientists working with the data used four different algorithms to find the wiggles, ultimately allowing them to pinpoint the masses of the merger and just how much energy was released. During the process of the collision, the equivalent of seven times the mass of our sun was destroyed and became energy leaving the system, so it's pretty impressive in terms of energetics if you think about it said Salvatore Vitali, assistant professor at LIGO. The equivalent of seven suns was destroyed in a very small fraction of a second, end quote. Yeah, in a tenth of a second, this black hole collision created 10,000 times the total energy that our sun emits over its entire lifetime. And here's another weird thing about this discovery. One of the black holes that merged, the larger one with the solar mass of 85, it really shouldn't even exist. Quoting Bad Astronomy, 85 solar masses is bigger than any black hole we expect to get from a single supernova. When a very massive star explodes, the core collapses to form a black hole. Cores from about 32 to 65 times the sun's mass, which is huge, are unstable, creating huge pulsations in the star which then explodes, leaving behind a black hole less than 64 times the sun's mass. Stars with cores from 65 up to roughly 135 times the sun's mass and these are absolute beasts, very few exist, undergo what's called pair production instability, where energies in the core are so high that gamma rays, very high energy photons of light, spontaneously split into electrons and positrons. This robs the core of energy it needs to support itself, and the results can be catastrophic. The star can either have a cosmic paroxysm or it can explode. 
The core itself detonates as well, leaving behind no black hole at all. Stars more massive than that should leave behind black holes in the IMBH or intermediate black hole range, more than a hundred times the sun's mass. But stars like that are incredibly rare. So a black hole with 85 solar masses is weird, and the only way we know how to create one is if two lower mass black holes merged to form it." End quote. So a lot of weird and unprecedented stuff in this black hole merger. As with all great discoveries, it has led to more questions than answers. Observatories LIGO and Virgo are both offline at the moment undergoing upgrades, but when they return at the end of next year, astronomers are hopeful that they'll be able to detect even more mergers like this one and maybe shed some light on some of these mysteries. The creator of one of the earliest viral videos on YouTube is back with a call to action. Maybe you remember this song from 2006? Oh my god, shoes. Shoes. These shoes rule. These shoes suck. These shoes rule. These shoes suck! That is the song Shoes by Kelly, the famous alter ego of comedian Liam Kyle Sullivan. He began performing as the character, who he once described as butthead and Napoleon Dynamite in a teenage girl's body, at live shows in 2005. In early 2006, he posted that music video along with an accompanying sketch on his personal website, which is how a lot of videos went viral back then. That is to say, not originally on YouTube at all, because the site itself was so new that it wasn't most people's go-to for posting videos yet. However, it was some people's go-to, and Sullivan discovered that a bunch of other people had been ripping the video off his site and posting it to YouTube, garnering thousands, millions of views. He eventually posted it to YouTube himself, and in the meantime, it was really taking off. Getting spots on traditional media like TRL, being recommended by mainstream comedians like Andy Samberg and Margaret Cho, who Sullivan would later go on a tour with. The full video that Sullivan finally posted in 2007 currently has 67 million views. But with adding in the other versions that Sullivan uploaded and the countless unregulated ones from other people, I'm sure it has been viewed way more than 67 million times. The song and character permeated throughout internet and pop culture for a while there. In 2008, the song even won the People's Choice Award for, and I love that this was a category, Best User Generated Video. And other nominees that it beat out that year, Chocolate Rain, Daft Hands, and Leave Britney Alone. While Sullivan kept on making comedy videos on YouTube for about seven years after that, he slowly dropped off, becoming a video editor for other people, getting married, having a kid, growing up, I guess, as he told Vice in 2016. But now he's back, or rather, Kelly is back, and this time it's not shoes she's so passionate about, it's masks. After a Zoom call with a newly woke dad and anti-mask mom, Kelly goes around town to closed shoe stores, showing off her favorite masks that rule, and a few that suck, to the same beat as the original shoes track. Here's a clip. Let's wear a mask. Let's wear a mask. Yeah. Let's wear a mask. Let's wear a mask. These masks rule. This mask sucks. This mask rules. This mask sucks! I do have a few questions. Like, later in the video, there's a bunch of people dancing on a Zoom call. Are those the same original people who joined the party in the shoes video? Or just random new people? Also, how does Sullivan as Kelly actually look younger than 14 years ago? Sullivan has yet to do an interview with any press, so my questions remain unanswered for the moment. The video was posted yesterday and is only at about 300,000 views as of recording, which is probably more than the shoes video got in its first 24 hours, but again, times have changed, and in terms of seeking virality, that's really nothing to write home about these days. But hopefully word will spread that Kelly of shoes fame is back with an important message about masks because our favorite viral stars from the early days of YouTube advocating for public health is kind of exactly what we need in 2020. Or exactly what I want, anyways. Every other video on Liam Kyle Sullivan's channel, the most recent of which before this one was posted seven years ago, 
have been marked as fundraisers for the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the WHO, which is being run by the United Nations Foundation. And this specific incarnation of it has appeared on many heavy-hitting YouTube channels. Google itself was matching donations for the first $5 million raised, but the fundraiser has now exceeded $7 million. And that's just the YouTube one. The overall COVID-19 response fund is over $224 million. Especially if you were at all aware of the original video, it's fun to see Sullivan don the costume again and do such a flawless job at this update, but mostly good on him for using his platform for good after all this time. The Australian government has just released a new $1 coin specifically designed to encourage charitable giving. The donation dollar will be officially released on Saturday to coincide with the United Nations International Day of Giving. The gold coin with a green center, the first Australian $1 coin not to be entirely gold, is legal tender that can be used just like any other $1 coin, but its special design is meant to make people stop and think about who might need it most. Words embossed around the edges of the coin read, Donation dollar. Give to help others. The green center has gold ripples that become more apparent over time, conceptually meant to illustrate the ripple effects that occur after the coin has been donated many times. The idea comes off the back of a downward trend in charitable giving in the nation, as well as a survey finding that 57% of Australians said they would be likely to donate the coin if they found it in their change. Three and a half million coins have already been minted with an eventual target of 25 million, one for every Australian. And officials emphasize that it's a long-term idea to get Australians thinking charitably, not a collector's item. The site UK Fundraising notes that some in the United Kingdom have proposed a similar idea in the past, but it's been shot down, making the Australian donation dollar a world first. On Friday, Santa Fe, New Mexico will play host to a 96-year-old annual tradition, although like most things in 2020, it will look a little different this year. No crowds, just a live stream. The tradition? The ritual burning of a 50-foot-tall effigy named Zozobra. The tradition was started in 1924 by artists Will Schuster and Gustav Bauman. The exact origins vary in the retelling, and the truth is probably a combination of it all. Essentially, Schuster and his buds, known as Los Cinco Pintores, or the Five Painters, who were among the artists responsible for Santa Fe developing into the art scene it's known as today, they were hanging out at a local bar on Christmas Eve when Schuster noticed they were all a bit despondent. No holiday cheer whatsoever. So he had his friends all write down anything that was bothering them on napkins. And then, when the bartender wasn't looking, he set the napkins on fire on top of the bar to burn away their gloom. Schuster and perhaps Bauman around this time also went to Mexico, where they observed the Burning of Judas, an Easter ritual in which people make an effigy of Judas and march him around town before burning him. Bauman, a marionette and woodblock artist, thought they could perhaps make their own version of this in Santa Fe. Ray Sandoval, the current chair of the event, notes that Schuster and other local artists were additionally bothered by the annual Fiestas de Santa Fe, a festival that began in 1712 and is still going to this day. It commemorates Don Diego de Vargas' reoccupation of Santa Fe after being run out by the Pueblo people years prior. The Fiestas has been criticized over the years for celebrating colonization, sanitizing history, being implicitly exclusive of other religions, and in Schuster's time in the 1920s, starting to charge admission and become a bit commercial. Sandoval told Mental Floss, quote, Zozobra was a protest against the lack of inclusivity in the Fiestas. Schuster so fundamentally understood human nature that Zozobra draws everybody in. It's not us burning a person. It's not racist, religious, or political. End quote. So Schuster and other artists started El Pasatiempo in 1926, which was free and included a parody of the Fiesta's pageant, as well as the burning of Zozobra, the character and larger-than-life marionette built by Bauman that had evolved from Schuster's idea of burning away your gloom. 
Starting in the 60s, when the Kiwanis took over control of Zozobra, the event merged with the Fiestas de Santa Fe, and the burning of Zozobra now kicks off the Fiestas so people can burn away their gloom before having a good time partying. Zozobra means anguish, anxiety, or distress in Spanish, and the figure itself is also known as Old Man Gloom. The legend goes that our collective gloom and stress from the year materialize into the specter of Zozobra. Zozobra is invited by the town to the fiestas, but when he shows up, he realizes he's been tricked and gets angry. So he kidnaps all of Santa Fe's kids and tries to use them against the adults, putting them under his spell. They become zombie-like figures made to do Zozobra's bidding, and are now creatures called gloomies. So the watching people of the town in response set to work summoning the Fire Spirit, who is made out of all of our good deeds and joy from the year. They summon the Fire Spirit by wielding torches and setting off fireworks, and all of these flames angers Zozobra even more, but also makes the gloomies, or the kids, snap out of their reverie. The Fire Spirit eventually overtakes Zozobra, and he erupts into a spectacle of flames and fireworks. Quoting Mental Floss, Each year, the wood, wire, and cotton cloth creation looks slightly different. Part monster and part ghost, he usually dons a long white gown. He often dresses for his night in the spotlight in a bow tie and tuxedo shirt, and his look often takes cues from current events that are causing fear and anxiety. In 1943, for example, Zozobra was a mashup of Axis leaders Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito, named Hirohitlamus. To reflect the 2020 zeitgeist, the creators have fashioned silver and red hair that looks like a coronavirus and have given him gold murder hornet cufflinks. It's been a banner year for Zozobra, Sandoval says, end quote. Zozobra often wears a cowboy hat and waves his hand in the air like a gun, which reminds me awfully of Big Tex, the 50-foot statue mascot of the Texas State Fair who tragically burned to his skeleton in 2012. Though that was just an accident, not a ritual burning. It still looked like my childhood had gone up in flames. Anyways, keeping with Schuster's original idea of burning away specific stresses from the year, people in Santa Fe are encouraged to write down anything they want to get rid of on slips of paper and leave them in a gloom box in the offices of the Santa Fe reporter. These are then placed at the feet of Zozobra and burned along with him. This year, however, there will be no crowd, and all grievances are requested to be sent digitally. It's free to virtually watch the burning of Zozobra, which will still go on, but you have to pay a fee to submit a gloom statement. It's just $1, but according to Mental Floss, as of yesterday, they've already received 20,000 submissions, which is a pretty good chunk of change for the festival. When I lived in Santa Fe, I was always away at school during the burning of Zozobra, so I'm pretty stoked to watch it live for the first time. And if you want to tune in as well, you can watch live on KOAT's website, Santa Fe's local ABC affiliate, this Friday evening at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 10 p.m. Eastern or 7 p.m. Pacific. That is all for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kaki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I am going to go listen to Muse's hit Super Massive Black Hole on repeat for the rest of the day. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>